Hi, I'm Matt from the Over Manga Cast. That time we woke up in a podcast and had to explain manga, our heated adventures over analyzing manga we find interesting. This week we are reading Golden Camry by Satoru Noda. Uh, we read chapters 1 through 21, which gets us right about to the end of the Escape King arc. Enjoy the episode. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome back to the Over Manga Cast. My name is Sam, and as always here at the top of the show, we like to talk about what our familiarity with the property we read this week is. Uh, for me, I had uh, not heard of this particular manga, though uh, in later posting some of the more humorous panels, uh, snapshots of them to one of my Discord servers that I'm in. One of my friends uh, did say that it was that it came highly recommended. So, uh, posthumous recommendation <laughs> is my experience with it. Uh, Matt, how about you? So, uh, Golden Camu, uh, I actually watched the uh, anime the first season, I think, when that came out. Uh, really enjoyed that, um, despite the fact that it had a pretty early CG bear, but it kind of worked for the terms. Yes. The, the CG is not, uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it is some very early on CG. Uh, it's uh, it's the same CG, I think, like uh, the Kingdom anime had, which it works better for Golden Cameo. Uh, so mm. but uh, I had never actually gotten around to reading the manga. And then I noticed it was in the Shonen Jump vault. And I was just like, I pay two dollars a month for this already. Might as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jay, how about you? So, similarly, I had um, seen the first season of the anime and was hooked from the start. Um, being interested in Japanese culture, specifically Ainu culture, is something that is not really um, covered in typical Japanese culture curriculum. So it was something that piqued my interest. And from that aspect, I became hooked. So I was really excited going into this. Mm -hmm. And Jacob. So I did actually have a little bit of knowledge of this series, mostly because, oh boy, the sheer number of Crunchyroll ads that were advertising uh, this show when it had come out. Uh, you couldn't watch a show without getting at least three ads for uh, Golden Cameo. And uh, sort of my reaction was, that looks neat. It looks a little bit weird because <laughs> I've since learned the ad depicted uh apparently the bad cg bear <laughs> um <laughs> so it was one of those ones where it's like not to say that like it was like uh low on my list but like i i considered checking it out but there was always something else to to watch whenever i was on crunchyroll uh so like i i did knew it, know it existed but uh i i never really uh experienced it until now uh, when it was mentioned as uh, something we should put on the reading list, I was all for uh, actually properly checking it out. All right. So uh, we start off with this uh, fun adventure manga with a gritty war scene as it is uh, the year uh, 37 of the Meiji era, otherwise known as 1904 in the common era and we join a whole bunch of uh imperial japanese soldiers affixing bayonets in a trench during the russo japanese war so you know things are just going to be hunky dory and cheerful going forward <laughs> you know it's sort of funny really strong vinland saga vibes like there are ways that it differentiates itself from vinland saga we'll get to a little bit later but um it has a very similar tone to vinland saga in that boy it does not cut away from violence the big whammy moment of uh, that first opening scene is you see someone get shot in the neck and then bayonet three people. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's an experience. In the midst of a massive over the top uh, trench charge moment where we see just people riddled with holes like an ice cream scooper was taken to their vitals. Like... It is a very unpleasant tableau. And then uh, said shot in the neck man who goes on a bayonet spree with his heavily yet aesthetically scarred face lets you know that he is our main character. <laughs> the immortal Sugimoto. Man, that's weird. How, how do you know that's his nickname, Sam? One of the first lines he says is, I'm not going to die here. And then uh, he doesn't die there. Yeah, in the middle of his bayonet berserker spree, screams, come on, try to kill me, try to kill me. He also constantly yells he's immortal was what I was getting at, but yeah. 
He speaks it into reality. I mean, that's okay. half the battle right there. We should want it, do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's the thing though. It's not just uh Sugimoto who says he's the immortal Sugimoto all the time. Everyone says he's the immortal Sugimoto all the time. Mm-hmm. Man, you must be the immortal Sugimoto. That's right. I'm the immortal Sugimoto. Do you know and this is the immortal Sugimoto? <laughs> How can you prove that? I'm not dead yet. That's, it's That's never true. going to happen. That's true. You're right. <laughs> and I'll also say this. He looks like the first three JoJo's rolled into one. <laughs> he kind of does. So, so wait, it, it, does that make this a JoJo's episode? Sam, do you have to leave? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I think Sam, cut him out. No! <laughs> but yeah, anyway. <laughs> anyway. We, we move on from the Russo-Japanese War and uh, catch up with uh, Sugimoto as he's uh, panning for gold in uh, a, a river in Hokkaido. Because mm -hmm. uh, life has not been kind to him uh, since the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, he uh, needs money. He needs money real bad. And he did. He is uh, not getting his uh, army pension, importantly, uh, because he attacked a superior officer and got kicked out. I'm pretty sure he killed that superior officer, didn't he? I thought he tried to kill him, but uh, mm -hmm. he, he very well might have. I... The point is he was dishonorably discharged uh, and so no uh, pension for him. There's an uh, older guy there who's like, uh, hey, why aren't you uh, living off your pension? And and the uh, reason for the attack given by Sugimoto was that he pissed me off. So uh, given the morality arc of shonen protagonists means that that authority figure was either mildly annoying or the most heinous bastard to ever live, possibly both. G given the tone mm -hmm. of the series, uh, it's probably the former, but it could be either. <laughs> yeah, this random old guy, this random old drunk, uh, is actually here to uh, let us know about the plot because <laughs> he's just watching Sugimoto do this gold panning and he says, man, you really want some gold? Let me tell you about the, the Ainu, the uh, folk that live around here. They got a whole bunch of the stuff and then a guy killed them all and took it. It's pretty metal. That is pretty metal, but why do I care? Because uh, he got put in jail. Okay. And and so no, he, he's the only one who knows where the gold is, right? Yeah. So he had a whole bunch of the other prisoners get the map tattooed on their skin. That is pretty metal. I'm not going to lie. I really love this scene because this is where it really cements like Golden Kamu, you all you know up until this point is like, man, this is brutal. And like, this guy's really cool. And right mm -hmm. here is where it turns into a Western. And I loved it. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny because, like, you know, like, there, there's always a point early in a series where, like, it's going to sort of, like, give the thrust of, like, whatever its, like, unique element is and, you know, whether or not you're on board with it. And here's this guy expositing so freaking hard and like he's he's swigging sake and obviously drunk so like you know it's like there's that level of justification but like it's such an obvious almost kind of it's not quite a grading exposition dump but it's right on that line he's trying to tell it like a spooky campfire story at mm -hmm. least given yeah. a little zazz and i'm sitting there thinking okay either this is the most like blunt way of getting through the exposition that the author could think of and they didn't bother to do anything more clever or that guy is totally one of the prisoners with the tattoos uh <laughs> wow as it turns out <laughs> Uh, another important thing to note about this is all these prisoners did eventually uh, escape, not by busting out of the jail, uh, but they were on uh, they were on the road, I believe, off to get executed. They were being transported by a particular military division. The, the military at the time didn't know what information those particular prisoners had, but they knew they had contact with the guy who stole all the gold. It's also a... Uh gets exposited twice and we're kind of combining both of them into one thing but mm. yeah to summarize it uh fully during the transport uh the prisoners were able to escape and uh they all scattered into the wind and were told that only the guy who hid the the friends of the guy who hid the gold would know how to use the map because the the map that was tattooed onto them was uh in code and basically this guy drunk 
exposits all of this all over uh, Sugimoto. And there's also a nice little flashback in the, like, while this exposition is happening of Sugimoto remembering why he needs the money. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, his, in, a very, uh, in a very grim nightmare scene. Oh, yeah, because it's after the exposition. He goes to bed and has this nightmare. That's right. Yeah. Where, you know, it, it's funny because like that's such a that's such a more natural way of giving exposition because it doesn't like just explain the plot to you through through a character just explaining the plot to another character. We learn that there is uh, a uh, at, at this point, what we know is that it is a military friend of Sugimoto's wife is uh, going blind and and he needs money for surgery and a ticket to America. The grim element of it is buddy in the military uh, melts because uh, his fate is kind of obvious at this point. Uh, yeah, I don't so think, essentially I don't... he needs the money to take care of his best friend's widow, um, mm-hmm. who has some health problems. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also implied in conversation, however, that in excess of this health problems, like it's implied that, you know, no one's going to want this woman who has health problems, but also has a child and, you know, mm-hmm. kind of can you take care of my widow? The only place you're going to get top notch medical care on like a really reasonable price, America. <laughs> <laughs> Look. It was the early 1900s, Matt. The world was a different place then. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he needs something to the akin of like uh, the math was something along the lines of like four hundred thousand dollars. So it, uh-huh. it is not a small amount of money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not a pittance by any measure. But uh, Sugimoto wakes up from this nightmare to uh, the drunk gold banner holding a gun to his head going, I said too much. And this is sort of the point where you're like, uh, so that was more clever than it initially appeared. Good. I'm on board now. I love <laughs> Sugimoto's reaction to this, too, because he's not upset he's being attacked. He seems a little excited he's being attacked because he immediately, oh, yeah. like, di- like he, this is a drunk old man. He beats the crap out of him easy, and he's just like, man, I thought you were just making up ghost stories, but no, if you're willing to kill someone over this, I know it's true. This must be real. I need some <laughs> money. In fact, if you're willing to kill over this, you're probably one of the people from the story. And then you're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> if only you hadn't reacted, he might have actually thought it was just a story. He <laughs> gave it away. He did. Yeah, he did vocally point out the fact that he thought that the guy was just being a drunk idiot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, By the way, next time you want to hold someone at gunpoint, maybe take the safety off, dumbass. <laughs> But yeah, uh, the uh, the old man uh, runs off into the woods. Sugimoto is not going to chase him down in the middle of the night. He's he's immortal. He's not stupid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he's immortal because he's not stupid. Well, at least that's probably how uh, uh, Sugimoto thinks about it. Uh, that it, it's debatable. <laughs> mm-hmm. We'll get there. <laughs> When he does wander through the woods, uh, uh, vaguely going after the guy, because it's like, if I let him go, he might come back and try to kill me. And I can't have him catch me while I'm asleep. So I should probably do something about him. Oh, uh, it's been handled for me, I see. As he finds his corpse buried in the ground, his guts ripped out and eaten by a bear, a massive flipping brown bear. Yeah, we also get to see the uh, actual tattoo at this point. It's at this point where this Uncharted story also becomes Man vs. Wild. We will get to the part where it also becomes Food Wars a little later. (laughs) It's quite the blend of genres. It is. And it works pretty well. He's like, ah, crap, bear. Uh, I gotta do something about the bear now. And oh, hey, he is tattooed with a map on his back. That's wild. That means there's a whole bunch of gold out there for me to take care of my my dead friend's widow. Awesome. What's this? Gold stolen from the native inhabitants hidden in some secret location? A whole bunch of criminals on the lam from the law out in the wilderness being tracked down by a bounty hunter with a gun? Oh, just so (laughs) Western. I love it. It, It's (laughs) so Western. It's great. (laughs) If only there was some kind of like native guide who knew the area super well to help this like person from out east who came here looking for money and if only no could... more. <laughs> as it turns out 
Say no more as the bear attacks and is promptly shot by a young girl with a bow. This is a a massive brown bear, so we get cool action scene uh, that ultimately ends with it's critically wounded and um, in desperation uh, sets about to uh, body slam Sugimoto. So he, uh, with his bayonet, drops to the ground and and plants it in the ground as the bear falls. With this is the native girl because that That's is the second bear. bear. Oh, yeah, no, oh, that's that's the second, the, oh, that was the, the second, second one. Cause, uh, yeah, because this uh, this manga does a little bait and switch where they fight off a uh, mama bear trying to find her cub. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I was like, so this must have been the bear that ate, that killed and ate that guy. No. Because <laughs> uh, the uh, Ainu, the native uh, girl, comes in here and saves the day with her poisoned arrow because she knows how to hunt. She can deal with this. As she's, mm-hmm. like, cutting the arrow out to keep the poison from infecting all the bear meat, because she's going to take that home and, like, it's good money, uh, mm-hmm. goes, hey, by the way, uh, that was definitely not who ate this person. He's like, what? Yeah, no, whoever did this was bigger. Uh, this mama bear had nothing in her stomach, so she was, like, hibernating like good. What you're looking for is probably a bear that's uh, eaten human flesh and has found out how soft and weak they are and has become an evil god. <laughs> <laughs> Metal. So, uh, <laughs> you should run away because if not, there's going to be a real big boss fight. Well, as it turns out, I never run from a boss fight. Also, I need that money for my uh my childhood friend's uh dying request. Also, you're an Ainu, and uh the gold that this dead guy's skin points towards is originally Ainu gold. So let's say we uh find it and go 50-50. Wait, hold on. You're saying someone stole a whole bunch of gold from an Ainu tribe? That's weird, yes. because my dad was murdered for a bunch of gold he had. This is the guy who killed my father? And I'm just sitting here reading this going like, this is so Western. <laughs> <laughs> the Magica has seen every single... Uh, all the all the classics and all the spaghetti Westerns and all the... Yeah. Like, and it, are you saying you're a soldier? I'm looking for the guy that shot my pa. Oh my god! I, I the only thought that was like running through my head is probably this juxtaposition was because at the time, more especially, is well, we know Japanese imperialist views of the Ainu people and um, what transpired. So it's just kind of like from you know the imperial Japanese position or the mainland. This is very much the Wild West. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, like, this is so much the case where uh, it's the same reason why a lot of samurai movies and a lot of uh, classic and spaghetti westerns, uh, like uh, a couple of famous examples of westerns and samurai movies literally remaking each other shot for shot. Like there, there is so much connective tissue here and it's leveraging that quite well. It's, it's both mm-hmm. like both of them take place in a place where like civilization is kind of an illusion that is kept in place by singular people with weapons. Mm -hmm. Like it is the fact that everyone believes this is how it is. And one person has the force of like violence, I guess is, is really what keeps things together. It's also what tears things apart too. Like there's a romanticism about it. Uh, yeah. it's, the, it's the frontier. Everyone's come here to build a life, and ostensibly that means cooperation. But there are certain harsh realities because the land is as of yet untamed from a imperialist point of view. So, and then they show up and it's like, oh, hey, there's already people here who have their own way of life and know how to live uh, in this land differently than we do. But they're <clears throat> weird and, and different and ew. They are, uh, they are the other. We must now conflict with them, but also we are all human. Hokkaido, Hokkaido is also a little weird because uh, the Japanese government is like, "Ew, the Ainu look kind of Russian, and we just got out of a war with them." And it's like, well, yeah. The, the comparison between uh, uh, how Japan treated Hokkaido and how the United States treated the Western section of of the North American Con- continent is is very similar. Mm-hmm. But getting back to uh, the story that we are reviewing, the uh, the young Ainu girl uh, notes the dead guy with the uh, tattooed skin, and she's like, huh, the way this is laid out is kind of weird. No, actually, no, I understand why it's laid out this way. Uh, he was meaning to skin this man. He's yeah. laid out the markings on this guy as if to strip his hide. Yeah, and I mean, like, that's sort of the thing for the uh, Ainu girl, who uh, I believe by this point has already introduced herself as Aspera. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, or a Serpa, sorry. Uh, a Serpa. A Serpa pretty quickly realizes, uh, Sugimoto explains that he has a tattoo that is a map to lead to the, um, to where the gold is. A Serpa's immediate reaction is, that is extraordinarily cruel because the only way you can read this map is by skinning this person. <laughs> it's, it's super weird, too, because, like, the two of, um, a Serpa and uh, Sugimoto have, like, very, like, differing opinions on, like, what is taboo. Because Sugimoto has absolutely no problem killing people. That is something that has been completely removed from him. Like, anything to survive is totally fine by him. But he is super squeamish at the idea that you would cut the skin off someone. Uh-huh. It, he's like, it's kill or be killed. Meanwhile, a Serpa is like... If you kill, then you go to hell. And he's like, well, I guess they've got a special seat waiting for me. Mm-hmm. They have the exact opposite reaction to it because the idea of, you know, skinning the corpse doesn't really bother a Serpa that much. Mm-hmm. But alternatively, the idea that uh, the intended way of getting that map was skinning and therefore killing a person is what she takes umbrage with. Mm-hmm. He's like, so- this, this entire treasure hunt is designed to, like, be a tool, a motivation for murder. That's what she has a problem with. Sugimoto is just kind of squeaked out about the idea of having to skin a human being, which, Mm. considering... (laughs) Between the two of them, I feel like they have the right idea that both of those things are not great. (laughs) Hey, it's surprising where people will draw lines. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they don't have much time to ponder this as the evil god bear shows up. And man, is it framed like it's some sort of possessed monster because uh, it just wanders into the firelight and um, its beady little eyes are black pits (laughs) as it is thrice the size of Sugimoto (laughs) roaring and charging through the burning fire. It has the taste for human flesh. It has a hunger that only human flesh can satisfy. And uh, my boy Sugimoto, Marcus Damon, he is not because uh, he tries to punch this bear in the face and uh, <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> but you know what? I got to give him props. He doesn't have time to get his gun. He punches it in the face. And it definitely stunned. Definitely is like, what the f***? <laughs> bear is momentarily is... stunned by. Did you think that would work? Did, did you just punch me? What? <laughs> But uh, Sugimoto uh, snatches onto the underbelly of the bear and uh, is screaming for a serpa to shoot it. Please shoot it. I can't wait here for long. And uh, the two of them work together as uh, he stabs the bear. She goes to shoot, but uh, it bounces right off the thing's head. It's such a cool scene because the entire time he is desperately scr- like holding on for dear life quite literally he's on the underside of the bear is like the one place it can't outright mm-hmm. maul him like it's like don't nope, yeah. shoot him shoot him shoot him shoot him please <laughs> <laughs> it's gone dark so she thinks he's already dead until he starts screaming until uh, the light of the moon is allowed and they say in hokkaido the full moon is even brighter than daylight Especially if you're a wolf, as a giant f***ing wolf leaps into the scene and attacks the bear, distracting it long enough as the as the wolf crouches protectively before a serpa. And I love this. It's a big I, doggo here to fight. I gotta say, this is where I I checked out. This was just too much Deus Ex Machina. I, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but but in, Doggo, in, though. <laughs> no, in this in this manga, cool shit happens, and like, yeah, bigger cool shit. Ha- this uh-huh. uh, it is not immediately apparent in this first arc, although it probably should. When they replaced, haha, do you know the boss fight was a bear? Here is a bear twice its size. A chapter later, like they double down in this. Yep, I make sure love- you pay attention. Now, look, I know the meme on the show is that uh, Jake is the one who has to immediately declare the animal his favorite character. I love Ratar, Ratar the Great White Wolf. I love him so much because, and this is the dumbest reason why, but my first Warcraft char- uh, World of Warcraft character was a hunter and my first pet was a white wolf. So I'm like, yes! <laughs> You're right, Sam. That is a really dumb reason. <laughs> but you know what? It is my reason and you i love it, it is a perfectly fine reason um should also Don't... be added that in the wild west um here in hokkaido that um, ritar is extremely like 
poignant just because mm-hmm. we learned that um, apparently, I don't know if it was the Japanese government or what, but essentially wolves were hunted to extinction. Near extinction. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, another parallel between the Japanese and American governments. Uh, yeah, no, and I mean, that's the thing. The Enzo wolves are supposed to already be extinct by this point. Whenever anyone sees uh, Rentar, uh, the immediate reaction is, I thought they were extinct. Yeah, mm-hmm. because uh, at this point in history, the Japanese wolf is still roaming around Japan, which is a much smaller breed. Hope There is a little, uh, like, author blurb at one point that says, By the way, Hokkaido is basically a completely separate island than mainland Japan. Animals there are huge. <laughs> <laughs> this is factually accurate and i'm like oh yeah <laughs> that tracks <laughs> works for me yeah. if it means if it means rad battles in the forest i am super about it essentially it. means they they build things a little differently in this island so. <laughs> they built different <laughs> they are all built different that is sadly a true fact that by the time that this story takes place the enzo wolf was in fact uh, had in fact been declared extinct uh, I mean, mm, if there's a pack of them the size of motorcycles, though. Right? <laughs> that'd be, you're right, that'd be really cool. <laughs> but, that was not what I was saying, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> the bear goes for one final attack, and uh, it's at this point that Sugimoto does the drop-on-back raise bayonet maneuver to have the bear impale itself on his weapon. Yeah, and uh, Aserpa is quite impressed by this maneuver because that is uh, that is something that the Ainu people will do sometimes if they're brave enough. <laughs> Gutsy move. It's not something that is just you know take to be taken lightly. Ah, uh, you are you are an expert. Well honed. It, it also has one of my favorite comedy panels. Is she's like, "Hey, you still alive in there?" And he pops his head out. I'm alive. <laughs> this this manga has like some amazing comedic timing where like mm-hmm. it will give you a beat to enjoy how ridiculously cool an action scene was and then throw like just a hilarious joke panel in and mm. it doesn't feel out of place there's a, a moment that i feel stretches the tone pretty far that we'll get to but just because this first like major battle uh does such a good job of this comparison that i made to vinland saga this is i think sort of an important element the reason why vinland saga having the like ultra hyper realistic standing next to the anime characters bugged me a little bit was because the background characters and the main characters were in two separate worlds this has that sort of element of like hyper real violence and yet like really cool awesome anime stuff like a guy punching a bear uh is in it too but it feels um blended a little bit better it feels less real than vinland saga does at its realist but also i feel like it uh it has a more consistent tone and it walks uh, the tightrope a bit better yeah it uh bridges that gap for me at least because you can go ahead and uh watch the episode on vinland saga uh it's not that vinland saga did anything wrong per se but it was uh, a bridge too far for me personally whereas i think because there's a bit of a wackiness to the tone of of golden kamiyu constantly golden so. kamiyu is pretty solidly camp yeah, yeah, even though it does hyper realistic violence and it sucks you into the story with it, it doesn't pretend that it's a documentary at any point, uh, except mm-hmm. for maybe the part where it becomes food war, but we'll get to that. It, it acknowledges you're following basically superheroes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who yeah. are kind of aware they're stronger than most individual people. The problem is they run into groups of people. <laughs> Yeah, uh-huh. which is what makes it cool and dramatic. <laughs> but uh, the alliance between uh, Sugimoto and Asirpa is officially uh, codified uh, to go and find the rest of the tattooed men to find the gold. Plus, and uh, uh, there's the really cool scene that I just enjoy because it kind of really cements Asirpa's character is mm-hmm. when they kill the demon bear. She is carving it up and hands the gallbladder to um Sugimoto, he's just like, yeah, this is valuable for you. He's like, well, no, let's split it 50-50. We both worked on it. She's like, oh, no, I'm not touching that thing. Yes. There's a comedy beat of, like, what is perceived as gross Mm -hmm. and valuable between cultures, and it's adorable. Mm -hmm. It's great, too, because it it really cements, like, earlier she said something along the lines of when he proposed a treasure hunt, she's like, well, I'm not killing anybody. And it's really because, like, her belief system is literally, if you kill a human being... Like, your soul becomes an evil god. 
like mm -hmm. yes yeah, so it's extends beyond just the bear it's just in general that's actually comes from like the animal kingdom of like if an mm -hmm. animal kills a person at all it just is tainted and becomes an mm -hmm. evil it, it is not to be touched it is not to be benefited from it is inherently wrong and that is a line i am not crossing and i'm not comfortable with really anyone crossing i know you've crossed it several times over and i'm fine working with you but i'm just telling you my line in the sand is i will not do this because by her mm -hmm. own logic she is working with a evil god yeah, because, like, the thing about this bear is this bear is huge, and they make it very clear, this bear is worth a lot of money. And she's mm -hmm. like, I don't care. It's wrong. I'm not. Because also what she does say is uh, when uh, Sugimoto keeps trying to say, well, yeah, we'll split the money. It's mostly yours anyway. I'll just take, like, a 5% share. Aspera constantly says, I don't care about the money. I care about the person that killed my father and my family, and I want him to face justice. Like, that's she the was point. Vengeance she's here to write a wrong. She she doesn't care about the gold at all, and she repeatedly mm -hmm. says she doesn't care about it. And that's something like Sugimoto Which never is, seems to really understand. I he think keeps it's interesting because even after she denounces, you know, wanting the gold, he's also not greedy. Like we've seen a lot of protagonists or a lot of campy guys who are then like, oh, if you don't want it, then I'll just take all of it. But he is consistent in saying this is fair. You know, you're helping me. No, it, it's it's both of them very, like, dutifully following their belief system. Because Sugimoto very much believes the fact, this was stolen from you. I feel wrong taking any of that. And Asper is like, the gold does not matter. I don't, I don't care about the gold. It's very strong characterization for both of them. Because from Sugimoto's perspective, when he says that I'll just take a small share, I'll just take enough to do the thing I need to do, it doesn't like it comes off extremely genuine like he's not saying this to trick her it doesn't like it, there's no like foreshadowing flags that he's going to betray her and and take all the money or something it really does feel genuine that when he asserts that like this is that gold belonged to your people i'm not just going to take it i need what i need because i'm doing this for somebody else but Everything else is yours, which does a really good job of endearing you to Sugimoto because in spite of how stained his hands are quite literally, he's, you still t can tell that he is ultimately a good person. Mm -hmm. And what he mentions to Aserpa that convinces her to be involved in the quest is, you know, he does show some understanding of her mentality when he explains when the gold is found, the only reason the man who murdered your father is hasn't already been executed for all of the crimes he's committed is because they know he knows where the gold is. If the gold is found, they'll have no reason to stay his execution anymore and he will pay for his crimes. It's not even a matter of like a quest to find the man so a Serpa can kill him because that's not something that she'd do. It's the punishment that has been allotted for him is being stalled because the gold is still missing. There, there's a debate on like the line between justice and revenge, but it gives uh, a serpent, at least from her perspective, more of a sense that, you know, as mentioned, she's out for justice specifically and not simply revenge. Yeah, I, I think, mm -hmm. I think in a serpent's case, they're actually the same thing. Like her revenge yeah. is the justice. I think, like, I think she does say something to that yeah. effect at one point as well. Yeah, like, because there, there is no point you think this is like a vendetta. This is, a, she's very calm about her father's death. She's just like, oh, cool. So that's the person who, like, that's why they all died. Well, I guess I'm dedicating myself to this now because, like, there is just a very, like, dutiful response to it. She's like, this is the right thing to do, not... She has a great deal of maturity. Mm -hmm. uh, Aserpa is probably the most mature character we meet the entire uh, section of reading that we did. In aggregate, there are a few points <laughs> where you are reminded that she's like 12. <laughs> well, like, you know, and it is it is the fact that like she's she's so mature and also she's so mature for her age. <laughs> Though I, yeah. do, I do think I do think even even in the sense of like. She's the only one who seems to have any compunctions at all about killing anybody or anything, which mm -hmm. that's but kind of a problem. At least for our pro main protagonist, it's partially understandable why he would have been tainted in this way. So oh, yeah, it's not no. as yeah, shocking. He's a soldier. Yes. Not just a soldier, an immortal soldier who is quite honestly seen a lot. 
And that's, that's mm-hmm. a lot. That's the other thing, too, is that they do keep a pretty distance uh, thing that they don't really ascribe the other to their, like, belief systems. They acknowledge that they belong to two different cultures mm-hmm. that have different viewpoints, and they're fine just letting people deal with their own things. Like, it's honestly kind of cool because they're really, really respectful of each other, like, almost to the point where there are some cases where one of them will uh, social taboo the other and uh, <laughs> the, 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 the minor slights have, have seem to have more of an effect because they recognize that, you know, it's two different cultures and they're not trying to convert the other. I think it's interesting also because they just have a very base difference of opinion. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not, oh, I, you know, prefer you know, my vegetables steamed versus fried, or it's not something, as you were saying, like arbitrary. It's something that's very fundamental to humanity. Mm. But the acceptance of this allows everything else to literally be like nothing of like, that's weird, or that's kind of gross, but whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they, they, they have more of a reaction to those things because they recognize how much they respect each other, which creates some of the funniest moments of of the of the reading. Anyway, the the two have decided that they're going to odd couple together a little partnership. Um, no, don't say that. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma will get involved later. <laughs> hey, you guys seem to they, get along pretty well. We'll get there. Um, <laughs> they, they, they team up. Yeah, and they uh, immediately... Serpa's really good at uh, trapping wild game. And Sugimoto's like, cool. We can use this uh, as they <laughs> go into the nearest city. They keep asking around for the tattoos and you're like, oh, are they just really bad at this? And then they leave the city. They specifically are asking around in uh, this particular town about the tattoos because this is a town rife with bathhouses and brothels. Uh, so. You mean the soba restaurants, right? <laughs> yeah, the very soba world. restaurants. Very, the, very good soba. The no so- underpants uh, shabu shabu restaurants. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so there's an awful lot of naked skin scene going on here. So it'd be, uh, and people with those tattoos would be notable. So uh, they go around uh, making a bit of a scene of themselves asking about the tattoos. You say that they were doing really badly at this. I'm like, hey, can't, can't fault them for like earnestly trying. <laughs> also, uh, speaking of making a scene for themselves, we get a nice bath scene of Sugimoto and a uh, man is scarred. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like his face is heavily yet aesthetically scarred. The rest of him is just heavily scarred. He has a chunk like missing out of his side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was almost... impressive. I'm trying to remember. It's a it's an older anime that um, had like a war a soldier kind of thing and they had a bath scene where like he's got all these battle scars except his face is like a how to draw manga boy character and you're just like <laughs> <laughs> golden Camu at least put, pays lip service to that that you're <laughs> it sure is weird that you're scarred heavily in every place but your face but okay and it's still mm-hmm. moderately attractive dare i say because <laughs> he's got yeah. that cool cross scar Oh, yeah. Indeed. Girls sure. love the cross scar. I want, it sure is great that that one scar you got, you got another scar that did a perfect 90 degree angle through it. That's mm. real convenient. <laughs> yeah, it looks real cool. Specifically, uh, Serpa's real good at catching game. The one that she, the, the technique she shows off is how to create little uh, lasso traps for squirrels, <laughs> which uh, when Sugimoto learns from uh, a uh, a bruiser that they... Uh, beat up a little bit that someone else has been going around asking about the tattoos he's like hmm the rope-a-dope strategy so they call it a day and leave town about a page of them obviously being followed later he's like okay how many are there just one he's been following us since we left town okay good let's go through this obvious curtain of icicles that (laughs) clearly will not conceal a trap the guy following them says ah they went through this obvious this uh curtain of icicles that is obviously not concealing a trap i will follow them and ah it's a trap how could i be fooled (laughs) <laughs> My favorite part is that this is a trap designed to catch squirrels, and uh, Serpa says it works because squirrels are lazy. So, <laughs> when that guy is lazy and doesn't check the obvious trap location, he gets caught. 
<laughs> There's also, I also uh, just in passing, uh, mostly because I agree with Sugimoto on this one. He's sad that they're eating squirrels because he thinks squirrels are cute. Yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> this this manga has a bad habit of showing uh, a serpo with cute animals, and then the the first panel of that act like as the cover page, and then the first uh, panel of that chapter is her skidding that cute animal. <laughs> I love a serpa, but that does hurt every time. I don't know. Squirrels are not substantive, but they're pretty good in a pinch. Well, no, if you eat all the bones. (laughs) Yeah, there's no sense of deboning that thing. That's why it's essentially degloved and then immediately, like, fried. After, well... Now we can just do the food wars bit right now because uh, they they have this little thing where um after this uh, bit we're in where they catch some squirrels and cook them up and it's basically like the entire front page of a new chapter is a little like cooking scene with uh, a serpa going like well this is how you make a traditional Ainu dish but I know you've got that stupid um, mainland Japanese stomach that can't digest raw meat and Sugimoto going like I don't think. Well, whatever. And she's like, I'm going to boil it into a soup as if you were a baby. And <laughs> But here, eat the brain. I don't want to. <laughs> eat the brain, Sukimoto. <laughs> so many good panels. This is actually what I was referring to when I was mentioning that, like, the smaller slights between the two of them uh, have more of a reaction out of them because they respect each other so much when one of them tries to share a little bit of their culture with the other and, you know, whoever it is turns their nose up at it. You know, it's like the Excalibur face. Yeah, you know, tries performing, uh, uh, trying something out, but is not happy about it. They, they're they a little bit more miffed about that than uh, anything else because, and, you know, it really it really speaks to their relationship and how close they are and how much they respect each other because, you know, <laughs> raw brains. <laughs> hey, conveniently, uh, typically at the end of their little food wars section, uh, they are very happy with the thing they just ate. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's it, a good it, cook. Good yeah. cook. These are also the realist parts of the uh, stuff, even more so than the violence, because it, it becomes a documentary briefly for a little while. And it's really cool learning, you know, little bits about I knew culture because it it like it, it gets out of like the voice of the the like fictional story we're following and kind of has this like top down perspective to whatever the scene is. Anyway, uh, as we said earlier, they had just caught a uh, person who was following them that they quickly find out was a tattooed prisoner. Uh, They were pretty sure of that (laughs) to begin with, Mm -hmm. but um, they strip him down uh, and then uh, a Serpa has the genius idea of, well, I'm not going to let you kill him, but we can just trace the the tattoo like if we just draw it out we can just plan that out and i'm just like that's a that's a very good plan this 12 year old girl that's a very good plan this 12 year old girl came up with like uh you would assume it, it feels like somebody else might have thought of that yeah that's why i say a serpent might be the, uh the most mature person full stop forget about her age <laughs> I, I will give the benefit of the doubt i think the reason is for everyone else on this treasure hunt there is literally no reason to leave a witness, so why not have the the like bare heart it, article rather than a replication? Yeah, no, no, it's no a, witnesses, no sharing of the uh, spoils at the end. Yeah, this, this is a bit of an odd comparison, but it is a bit like uh, Platinum End, where nothing explicitly says this has to be a death game, but the rules heavily encourage it. <laughs> they're, they finish up the tracing and they're getting a little exposition out of the guy, including uh, the man who knows the location of the gold, the killer, the faceless man, no parabo. And then he gets shot in the head. I was about to say, yeah, as if he said Voldemort's name. <laughs> <laughs> Splat. He is sniped out by a sniper in a military uniform. It's a it's a hell of a shot, too. <laughs> this, of course, immediately uh, twigs Sugimoto off to the fact that, ah, crap, we got to get out of here. Run, 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 sniper, run. Because Sugimoto immediately recognizes that was a really good shot. That was a professional. A lot of the moments have um, a Serpa taking the lead because, like, she understands the, the land that they're on and has all of these, you know, clever traps that Sugimoto would never think of. But, uh... You know, like there's a really nice balance to it because at this point, this is Sugimoto's area of expertise, and you know, he's the one taking the lead. And uh, 
Mm -hmm. We do get a bit of the moment of Sugimoto just being a supernaturally good soldier because there is a panel of him going from the lag between the bullet striking its mark and the sound of the gunshot. I've calculated that the shot was fired from 200 uh, con or 300 meters away. <laughs> Which, conveniently, they'd also made traps 200 meters away. <laughs> so what appears to be running for cover, in actuality, it was a <laughs> diversion to think, mm. make the sniper think that they had them, when really, they used that to get close and get the jump on him. Mm -hmm. Draw them into one of the traps. Really great scene where uh, Sugimoto is just like, I've got a gun trained on you. He's just like, not going to do much without the firing pin. And Sugimoto looks down at his gun, now missing apart, and is like, the hell? <laughs> <laughs> How did you? Oh no, I am out of my depth. <laughs> <laughs> He's from the unit chasing after the gold, the strongest unit in the army, the Hokkaido 7th. And they square up for this super soldier on super soldier battle. I do love the moments where it's Sugimoto versus other uh, military guys, because at that point it feels very Jojo in that it's two people with ostensibly way more information than anyone would ever reasonably have acting on these encyclopedias worth of Intel oh, yeah. as, as they read the situation a nanosecond at a time. The fight between him and the other soldier is hilarious. That exposition dump because it's them talking about like, ah, I think you know about the treasure, don't you? It's like, yeah, but I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for the woman I love. And I'm like, wait, hold on. What? <laughs> you said all we've gotten so far is this is about your dead friend's fiance or your dead friend's widow. This is new information, Sugimoto. We don't, even, we don't even know if Sugimoto has met his friend's wife. Yeah. Well, we do. Mm -hmm. We get a flashback about We do about now. It. Oh, yeah. Oh, th you're right. At this point, we don't even know if he knows her. Yeah. Uh, yep. In, in this line, he says to a stranger, he cements that this is a very different relationship than you might have thought. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then uh, they get in a little CQC uh, fight going on. Uh, Sugimoto ends up winning and is going for the stab, but Asirpa's like, remember, no stabbing. No stabby stab. Wait a minute, she just called you Sugimoto. So you're the immortal Sugimoto, huh? Well, that <laughs> and... changes the complexion of the situation I'm in. Huh, so now you're ready to fight with all you've got, right? Hell no, I'm gonna run. <laughs> you broke my arm and you're the immortal Sugimoto. I am leaving. <laughs> A man slips on top of a cliff and falls into a river. The soldier from the 7th Division uh, was recovered from the river, and he's uh, returned to the rest of the 7th Division. Uh, but the only thing that when he regains consciousness, the only thing he can get out before he expires is a single word. Immortal. Written in the snow with a shaky hand. <laughs> that, if that's not an omen, I don't know what is. Well, you know what the o real omen is? The end pe page for this chapter is the seventh division on like horseback and standing up with like torches in the dark. They're silhouetted. It's so cool and menacing. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's big wild hunt energy. <laughs> Maximum aesthetic. The, this manga has an absolutely masterful aesthetic. I, I dig it a lot. My secret theory is that the horse is secretly the leader because he was featured most prominently. <laughs> <laughs> Look, given what we actually learn about the leader, I wouldn't be surprised. Anyway, uh, since since their woodland traps work so well the first time, they just keep doing it uh, <laughs> and then get another saying... guy. I'm just saying, are people really this dumb? Yes. yes. <laughs> Considering from this guy, we get the exposition that there were only 24 prisoners total. It's insane they ran into two this quickly. <laughs> yes. And I don't know if anyone got the sense that from the exposition, from the story being told, like it gave the impression that this happened several years ago. So it wasn't something... That happened rather relatively recently, like the search oh, had yeah. just begun. I agree with that assessment, but also I think what I took away was that there there's an indeterminate amount of time between them catching the two people. So that could have been that could have been weeks. Also, mm -hmm. we actually do know the exact time frame because the Russo-Japanese War ended three years ago. Yeah. yeah. So, I also when... had to factor in that a Serpa, she remembered you know, her dad was caught up in that and that there, she remembered the gold and she remembered her dad being caught up in that. Yeah, the, the gold happened after the Russo-Japanese War is the thing. Yeah, yes. so yeah. it's it's three-ish years that this has been going on. Yeah, so it's 
Well, less than three years, and, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's still plenty of time for all these weirdos to congregate in one geographic region and start killing each other. So. Which is why it's so bizarre that they get caught up in these woodland traps, because I could understand if they were mainlanders who are fresh <laughs> to the area. See, what the heck I, have I, they been doing the entire time? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, they've been hiding in cities. Yeah, because because there's like a uh, talk that like I think they get from the first guy they catch. It's mentioned that when they escaped, it was recommended that they um uh, slowly they slowly move towards these two cities in Hokkaido because uh, they're they're big enough that people wouldn't notice newcomers, but they're remote enough that uh only somebody who already knows about the gold would ever come looking well, for them. I think I think Sugimoto comes to that conclusion. Like he's just like people out here in the boonies are going to notice a stranger like they're going to mm -hmm. turn in or more likely if it's someone who seems sketchy, they just aren't going to trust them. So the only places they can actively look for these people are like the five cities there are in Hokkaido. Yeah. And another thing is most of these guys are like s criminals from urban environments or soldiers. They're used to. They're used to watching for traps for humans, not traps for animals, which are, is a subtle but distinct difference, as is. Uh, and also, I don't think that the guy that they got is very smart. I was going to point out the uh, the the immutable truth that people be dumb. Uh. <laughs> but um, they do cap they do capture another guy in there. Uh, uh, sketching out his tattoos, and uh, he does a racism at a Sirpa, which Sugimoto is uh, ready to beat his ass for. And she's like, oh yeah, it, uh, it doesn't bother me. I'm used to it. To which Sugimoto's uh, internal monologue asks the very, very important question, why should you have to get used to it? I love that line for how much it hurts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, he then goes on a flashback about why he has that opinion, too. Like, uh-huh. Because um, he, he flashes back to his village where apparently he was viewed as garbage because I, I, I had trouble understanding the flashback. I think his family had a sickness. They had con they had consumption. OK, yeah, they had. Con it, it wasn't that it wasn't that they, that Sugimoto was seen as like a lesser person. He was un he was untouchable because his family had consumption. So nobody would go within a mile of him because he might have it, too. Yeah. And yes, that's the reason why he got isolated. Yeah, so because he was sick, they viewed him as less of a person, though. That's the well, thing. Yeah. He, ne yeah. he never was sick. He was affiliated with sickness. Um, but that is enough <laughs> for some people. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. no, because he, he, he leaves the village uh, thinking yes. that he might, and that's when he goes off to join the military. Yes, so it's not so much that he was sick and that he had to leave. He His... He was, quote unquote, socially tainted, left to then prove that he would not succumb to sickness like his family and ended up joining the military. Also, mm -hmm. this is all background because we get the real juicy gossip <laughs> that uh, Ume, goss. the girl who was married to his friend in the army, apparently yeah. wanted to run away with him. Yeah, he was pretty hot. Pretty hot. Upset at what the people were saying. He's just like, wait for me. I'll marry you when I come back from being sick. And then two years later, he comes back to the village to find out she's already getting married. And I'm like, girl, you two years. What? <laughs> he says he's going away for a year, I thought. And then it turned into two years. But also, we have to also give credit the fact that her family was encouraging her to like, Hey, why don't you marry the nice neighbor boy? He's really nice. Yeah, I think I think Sugimoto even says something to the effect of like, if I don't come back right away, don't wait for me. Don't be unhappy. Because when he does come back with a bouquet of flowers to give to her and sees that she, you know, of course, he returns on her wedding day because, of course, yeah. he does. <laughs> he course. returns in the middle of the procession, the wedding yeah, like, procession. <laughs> the worst possible time. <laughs> but, like, the reaction that he has is another case where I think it's really good characterization for Sugimoto because as absolutely shattered as he obviously is, he also seems genuinely happy that, you know, she moved on. There's the sense that, like, she you know, did she want to move on, blah, blah, blah. And one one thing that I think is a big element of Sugimoto's character is that he he wants what's best for people, but sometimes he can miss some relatively obvious cues that maybe him doing something self-sacrificing hurts people more than it helps them. Because this is not the only case where he does that sort of thing in our reading. 
Yeah, but anyway, while he's too busy flashbacking, he doesn't notice that the prisoner they have hit a razor blade tied to a... <laughs> I, I, gotta, I gotta fully explain how insane this is. This man constantly has a strand of horse hair tied to his back molar that dangles down his throat where he has wrapped in wax paper a small blade so that he can regurgitate it out partially <laughs> to then cut through things. I mean, that's not insane. He's also an escape artist, so I mean, he's got a contingency plan for this kind of stuff. Matt, I fear you might be selling our, our man, Yoshitake Shiraishi, the escape king, a bit short. He does not have one bit of horse hair tied to a, a back tooth dangling down the back of his throat, uh, so he has tools. He has several, <laughs> including bullets. We do find out later, yes, he has eaten bullets. <laughs> <laughs> which makes me wonder like how many near misses has he been involved in that he has then built these contingencies <laughs> so he is, a, he is a tattooed prisoner that is still alive and a free man which mm -hmm. is exceedingly rare <laughs> that's fair <laughs> we see him in a flashback contorting through a through a uh it's glorious. narrow viewing window of his cell. <laughs> the man is essentially a cat. If he can fit his head through it, he can fit the rest of him through it. Like famous boy of the podcast, Inosuke, he is able to dislocate all of his body parts <laughs> and potentially rearrange his internal the organs at will. So obviously I'm interested. You know, a confirmed canon thing that definitely wasn't made up. <laughs> Shut up. How dare you? Yeah, uh, he, did, he does have one of the best panels in the entire freaking manga. He uh, he gets ex he gets a whole bunch of gross panels, I think, on purpose, where his body <laughs> goes in angles. <laughs> but it's so funny. I love it. Well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll rebuttal against your claim earlier, Sam. Uh, I don't think he's much of an escape king because, despite the fact he broke free, he is immediately tackled by Sugimogoro, and they both go falling off a cliff. Because anytime you run in the forest, you fall off a cliff. I I think that's just what happens. Uh, you see, yeah. he, he just has I want to say horror movie protagonist luck. Like <laughs> <laughs> he kind of does, yeah. Well, yeah, I no, no, can't no. Run. I'm gonna fall down times well yeah it, 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 this is um where we get the day after tomorrow scene though where uh i'm mocking it but they actually do a really good job of presenting it where um a serpa hears the cracking of trees and goes oh no that means a cold front's moving down the mountain that flash freezes stuff and everyone's just like oh no cold air we need to run mainly yes. because that scene in day after tomorrow where they outrun the cold yeah, well, to be fair, they don't outrun it. They are currently clambering down a cliff when this comes. And the, and uh, Sugimoto is still chasing after Escape King when they break through a, uh, a snow cornice and both of them tumble down into the river as a, as a minus 30 Celsius cold front is sweeping towards them. Needless to say, they are boned seven ways from Sunday. I have 10 minutes to warm up or they will die. <laughs> hey, have you ever read To Build a Fire? <laughs> I was very anxious during this. <laughs> like, I I like the cold, but hypothermia ain't nothing to fuck with. <laughs> yeah, and this is where we get some amazing scenes of the two of them scrambling, holding each other for warmth, stripping, and then finally vomiting up a bullet to... <laughs> punch into a log to create some fire because everything else has been like washed out by when they get cliffed they landed in a river and scrambled out i think this is actually also uh worth noting a really good character scene because we see uh we see our escape king he he like the delirium takes him really fast and he basically gives up almost immediately whereas sugimoto becomes frantically survival oriented like it doesn't matter how much you impair him that is that is like his most core element of his being well you see he jacob is sukimoto yeah he he just didn't die <laughs> everyone uh, else so just dies for some reason you just don't do it it's so easy you just have to make it the core of your being and then you will you will die i simply would not get hit <laughs> 
But Sugimoto's like, okay, rifle. We can shoot some wood to cause a fire. My rifle is at the top of the cliff. Bullets! They all fall out in the water. Okay, I'm going back in the water. You gotta help me find these bullets. Uh, well, I'll make a deal. I'll help you if you let me go. You dumbass, you'll freeze to death. <laughs> if I'm gonna die anyway, I might as well die a free man. Okay, fine, I'll let you go. <laughs> and that's where that's where we get the uh, the uh, delightful revelation that he has several of the horse hairs tied to molars wrapped in wax paper. It is a whole page of him vomiting up this bullet tied to a tooth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying we're laughing at the audacity of the situation, but I'm sure if you were in the situation, you would not be laughing. Oh, also, I, oh, yeah. I want everyone to know this. This is a rifle bullet. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty I, beefy. Yeah, like, I don't know the exact caliber, but it is a choking hazard. I don't know how this man eats. You don't understand. <laughs> he doesn't have a gag reflex. Ladies. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> Fellas. Yeah. That, <laughs> it has primal. no benefit to one. It's Pride Month, Matt, be inclusive. But anyway, they awkwardly then sit naked next to each other because they have to warm up <laughs> yeah, by the yeah. fire. And uh, he is rewarded with some exposition about uh, the prison break was not orchestrated by the uh, faceless man. It was actually orchestrated by another one of the prisoners who uh, was an old man who um, basically never really seemed much. He always like was a model prisoner. Uh, until the escape happened and he grabbed a sword from one of the guards and killed basically all the guards by himself. Because this man was the former vice captain of the Shinsengumi, Hijikata Toshizo. And uh, <laughs> he's out here looking like Sword Saint Ishin from Sekiro uh, and will be even more so later. But uh, we can't just introduce one antagonist. We have to introduce another. So we also get a brief glimpse of the head of the 7th Division. The uh, <laughs> Well, he doesn't have a name yet, but we will just refer to him as Forehead Plate Man because he has a forehead plate and um, it's, it's pretty distinctive. But with our antagonists introduced and our uh, protagonist saved from an icy death, I think we're going to go into the mid-roll break as we're about halfway through our reading. So stay tuned. We will be right back. Let us resume. Resume. <laughs> resume. <laughs> Welcome back, folks. Where last we left our intrepid adventurers, uh, Sugimoto had just uh, narrowly escaped death once again with the um, rather disgusting aid of the Escape King. And so had learned that the orchestrator of the breakout that started this whole fiasco is a uh, super badass old samurai dude. And also there's a guy with a forehead plate. Sugimoto doesn't know that yet, but uh, we do. So dramatic irony. We get a, a bit on I knew rabbit cooking. And this time it is a bit of uh, Sugimoto's culture uh, that uh, gets sneered at. He, he finds the rabbit to be quite good, but he feels like it would be uh, perfect with a bit of miso, which... Uh, Sugimoto, why are, Sugimoto, why are you putting poop inside of your food? <laughs> why are you putting poop in the soup? <laughs> <laughs> poop in the soup! This mainland Japanese person's a soup pooper! <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh, Sirpa, I literally ate a rabbit eyeball five minutes ago let me have this it's poop <laughs> it's not poop I am not a poop super <laughs> here I'm gonna use your word for yummy while I eat this while I eat the, the soup poop here henna 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 <laughs> ew he loves the taste of poop soup <laughs> <laughs> this feels like a Seinfeld bit <laughs> It does. It but kinda... re reminder that a Serpa is 12. <laughs> well, and I mean, like, I kind of love it for it because, like, it, again, it's such a great character moment of, like, these two connecting in the way that they do. Like, the things that they do that they have a problem with are, like, these, like, minor funny things. 
Ah, and then uh, we return to the the Golden Kamu uh, formula of there is a bit of hunting in wilderness expertise, which is putting Chekhov's gun up on the shelf for later in the action scene of the chapter. In this case, uh, they happen to find a uh, a bear den, which, uh, thanks to some icicles, means that there is uh, a warm, moist air coming out of there, like the breath of a sleeping bear. <laughs> so what do we do about it? We leave. The only <laughs> person mad enough to crawl into a bear's den was my dad. But then again, he believed that if you go into a bear's den, the bear won't kill you because it it is impressed by the size of your balls. So <laughs> she doesn't include that last part, but... <laughs> It's it's very heavily implied. I also yeah. I also kind of like that just because this is such a common misconception, they actually point out the fact that bears don't technically hibernate. If you go into a bear's den you during the winter, you are rolling the dice on your life because they will wake up and kill you. They just sleep more in the winter. They do not yeah. sleep the whole winter. Yeah, they don't because uh, uh, hibernation uh, actually reduces an animal's metabolism, whereas bears literally just sleep more and they will mm -hmm. wake up. Yeah, which is so a good point. Equate like hibernation to being dead to the world too, and it's just like no, still oh, maybe like asleep. Look, the bear has some seasonal affective disorder, but it still has an active social life. It reaches <laughs> yeah, yeah. out to people. It goes to brunch. Oh my god! <laughs> it posts pictures of the cubs. Yes. Yeah, but not the cubs. Uh, those it doesn't support losers in this household. <laughs> <laughs> you know so what you I, did, Chicago. That was a sports reference. Chicago <laughs> knows what it did. Chicago no, does know what it did. <laughs> they pissed off the king of the fairies. Mm -hmm. That's a Justin Files reference. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> back in Hokkaido. <laughs> back in Hokkaido, our heroes are wandering through the forest when they notice some flashing in the distance. Uh, it, it, isn't that where we stayed last night? Ah, uh, oh crap, those are binoculars. Run, they've spotted us. <laughs> and we get and then... an, ep an epic chase scene involving skiing. Yeah, this is really this cool. epic. It's very epic. It's this... it's almost like a Bond movie because it's like goons on like an orchestrated ski maneuvering thing. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The skis feel atonal for like a page. And then it's like, oh, no, wait, that's actually just a really effective way to get down a snowy mountain and uh, close the distance of people on foot. Oh, this is really tense. Well, they, they explain their Russian skis, too, because they're wood mm -hmm. with seal fur on the bottom so that you can walk uphill with them. Sugimoto's like, okay, uh, we split up. You take the tattoos. <laughs> Here, take this package of human skin and run, he says to the child. <laughs> Excuse me, child, hold my illicit goods. They're not going to search you too hard. Don't speak English. <laughs> Well, don't, don't speak Japanese. Are you sure? Also, don't okay? speak English. That'd be very <laughs> confusing. <laughs> yeah. Or would it? You better not be thinking of fighting them. They'll kill you. I'm a mortal Sugimoto. It's fine. We get two uh, separate chase scenes where one of the officers goes off uh, in the direction of a Serpa, where the rest of them. Uh, uh, they corner uh, the immortal Sugimoto in front of this completely innocuous hole in the ground. Weird that it has icicles. A man mm -hmm. is hiding in a bear den. <laughs> <laughs> He's not hiding yet. Oh, we get my favorite panel right here, too, which is the guy looking for him in the bear den. And it is a full white panel of a claw just appearing and ripping off the dude's face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they they're standing there confronting him for a minute and uh, trying to talk him down or or uh, and they're just like, ah, oh, whatever, just shoot him. And Sukimoto decides it, I'm immortal and dives headlong into the bear den. In other words, he has huge balls. <laughs> We were joking before about him constantly talking about how he's immortal, but like this is this is the most closest it gets to actually be him. I mean, he literally just screams, I'm immortal and leaps into a bear den. I mean, pure mad lad here. He he is believing his own hype in that moment because he's got no other choice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the alternative is get shot. So like it is the only I mean, option he has. So if you were truly believing this, would you rather get shot or Get mauled by a bear. God, I, I've I've seen the Revenant. I'd go for get mauled by a bear and then come back months later in order to get revenge. 
Okay. <laughs> I honestly don't know which I'd pick. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there is a brutal fight between the bear and the seventh division soldiers. Uh, one of them is killed because uh, the guy who got his face ripped off uh, flailed about in sudden agony and shot the other guy. The bear knew what it was doing. Remember when I mentioned there was one particular scene that stretched my suspension of disbelief harder than anything else? Uh, the dude who didn't have a jaw, who flailed in pain and happened to shoot one of the other soldiers, at the end of the fight, gets up and continues fighting the bear briefly. <laughs> he then Evenly falls dead again. Yeah. He succeeds. He's the reason that the, that the bear dies. Well, actually, the reason that the bear dies is a different character. Um, who The one who uh, went after Asirpa, which we did this a bit out of order, but we get Asirpa scene first. As, uh, she they pulls... go back and forth between the two. Yeah, but uh, she pulls the classic uh, walking backwards over your own tracks in the snow thing to uh, not be noticed and fool pursuers. But unfortunately for her, uh, Matagi of Toko, uh, a wilderness man himself, has seen animals do this countless times and so finds her easily. He's able to uh, find her up in a tree. And uh, thus a tense standoff between her and uh, the soldier and also Ratar, who shows up because he is best boy. He is the goodest pupper. Yes. So she tries to assuage capture by pretending to not, under not Japanese. understand Japanese. Mm -hmm. And this is obviously very frustrating until she attempts to... I believe she attempts to fire at him and he tells her to drop it or, you know, halt. Mm -hmm. And she hesitates. Ah, so you did understand what I said. Oh, another one of my favorite segments happens during the bear fight of one of the soldiers just seeing the bear go crazy and maul a bunch of his boys. Stands there and goes, calm yourself, bear. My grandfather worked in the mountains making charcoal and said, if you talk down a bear, it works. <laughs> The bear yes. then proceeds to maul him to death. Well, no, Sam, my favorite part is his story ends with, unfortunately, my grandfather was killed by a bear. And then the person with him is like, the... that means he doesn't know <laughs> about bears. <laughs> <laughs> he shoots the bear in the head, which, as pointed out earlier, doesn't work. because this makes him angrier. <laughs> It just makes them angrier, so he gets mauled to death, but manages to stab the bear enough for Faceless Man to get up with his revolver and finish the job before falling over dead himself. It's quite the tableau. <laughs> and then... The Serpa has a pretty good quote at one point about, like, how the Ainu don't aim for the head because bears are so strong that just tells them where the shot has come from. Brown bear skulls are that thick. And then uh, the uh, uh, that little incident ends with um, uh, Sugimoto uh, climbing out of the uh, the bear den, holding an absolutely adorable little bear cub. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's so cute. He's so cute. He goes boo, 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 boo. He has bonded immediately with this tiny baby bear cub. <laughs> I want to boop. I've bonded immediately with the bear cub. I want to boop the snoot. Yes. But uh, Ratar defeats the soldier, and Asirpa manages to uh, convince him not to murder the guy. It's like, you can't become an evil spirit. You're the last wolf god. But still, thanks for saving me. Who wants your belly rub? <laughs> and then she gives the pupper a belly rub. It is very cute. It is. Uh, but when uh, Sugimoto arrives, uh, Ritar immediately uh, run gets up and runs off. Yes, probably because Bear. <laughs> but also, Su he does not like Sugimoto, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he's not a fan of most humans. It's that really just a, yeah, it's really just a Serpa that he uh, is fond of. Also, uh, Sugimoto is hiding the bear cub in his jacket because he is terrified of uh, a Serpa's reaction to cute animals so far. <laughs> Which is kill, skin, and eat them. <laughs> Sukimoto, what is that? Buh, 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 buh. Her head pops out and it's very cute. <laughs> Damn it, Barry, gave yourself away. And she starts drooling and you're like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and Sukimoto is like cradling the baby bear. I'll take good care of him. I'll be his new mother. <laughs> huh? I'm not going to eat him. What? 
No, we're going to raise it to adulthood and then sacrifice it ritualistically as a, a sacrifice to the gods. What? Yeah, that's why you don't grow attached to the things. I made that mistake when I was little. Uh... <laughs> anyway, we're going back to my village. Having this conversation on the way back to her village because they also need a place yeah. to hide out and resupply because uh, they have now lost two camps mm -hmm. in a row, so being hotly pursued now that they know who he is. Yeah, the um the the soldiers are able to put together uh what immortal meant. I think um there there were a couple of cases where like the soldiers that had uh been pursuing them cuz uh they they obviously don't get back to uh report to um uh, and Sugimoto uh, tries to say he has no idea what they're talking about, what gold. But when he eventually introduces himself as Immortal Sugimoto, not knowing that the first uh, Seventh Division soldier he fought had survived long enough to scratch Immortal into the snow, uh, and they're able to realize what's going on, and thus the fight. Anyway, uh, they Sugimoto and uh, Aserpa make it back to her village. We get. A pretty cool just like little montage of Ainu customs. Uh, mm. Sugimoto is very self-conscious is probably the best word because he's like, these people probably hate outsiders and I know what the mainland Japanese have done to their people. They probably think I'm awful. And then uh, a surface just like, no, they're actually probably, you're kind of an oddity. They're all just really kind of like gawking yeah, at you. Yes. Yeah, the Ainu are very curious people. That's why we have so many poisons. <laughs> we have 10 deadly poisons. I will teach you nine. The 10th I may one day need to use on you. <laughs> we learn of uh, perhaps my favorite custom, which is to uh, name children after uh, disgusting things in order to ward off evil spirits because the evil spirits are like, ew, I wouldn't want to. Uh, it, I wouldn't want to possess someone named Poop. I mean, are they wrong? <laughs> and then the, uh, later on in life, as they mature, they get their actual name. Yeah, they as they uh, you know develop their skills and whatnot, they get a more fitting name. Mm -hmm. We learned this because of one particular um, <laughs> brat, really, who <laughs> comes up and pokes uh, Sugimoto a few times. What's your name? My name's Osama. I know that means poop. Stop messing with me. No, it's true. His name really is that. Oh, so what was your uh, disgusting childhood name? It was Ecasio Tampui. It means grandpa's asshole. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty gross. <laughs> <laughs> she seems so proud of it, too, by the look <laughs> on her face. We then get to meet my favorite character, which is uh, Aserpa's grandma. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> grandma is great. Grandma is very unhappy that her uh, granddaughter is not a more, because uh, 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 I knew culture is very gendered. Um, mm. Except, uh, unfortunately, due to her parents dying at a young age, uh, or her mother died when she was very young, um, her father took her out hunting a lot. Yes. Because uh, she had no brothers. Yeah. And uh, Aserpa's uh, grandmother was not happy about that because now she is, like, over 12 years old and she hasn't got her face tattoos yet. That means she's of marrying age. Like, what, what are you supposed to do here? <laughs> Aserpa is a bit of a tomboy by Ainu standards. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, but I mean, it's also the fact that her grandmother's unaware of the circumstances surrounding her unique situation. And I would mm -hmm. argue, did grandma ever have that conversation with, is it her son that was her father? Yes, I think so, yeah. Because the point is, grandma could have raised her. Grandma could have provided some mentorship here. I think Grandma tried and Aserpa wasn't having it. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that we wouldn't have uh, badass Aserpa as we have her, and I, I, I think she's awesome, so yeah, I'm but okay with the circumstances. It's also fair to say that she's not, Grandma's not upset. She's disappointed because Grandma <laughs> yeah. does really still love her granddaughter. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, Grandma's yeah. not upset at Aserpa. She's just sees a very easy solution to remedy the problem she thinks she has, which is she needs her 12-year-old granddaughter to be married. <laughs> Mr. Oh, Sugimoto, please take this girl as your wife. I have no idea what she's saying. Could you translate that for me? Sirpa. She says people shouldn't eat poop. It's she's me, so! 
Oh, I love the panels of a Serpa having to try and translate what her grandma is saying because she's very like diligent about it up until her grandma gets on the point of like, hey, you should really be married by now. This guy's pretty cool. He looks like he's pretty strong. Looks like he's successful. He'd be a good husband. And she refuses to translate because she is so embarrassed. She's like, yep, I'm not even going to touch that. Nope. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah. and I mean, like, it, it, it's one of those cases where all the way up to this point, there's like a very strong sense of you're you're getting a lot of like subtext hints that they have sort of like a, a bit of a father daughter slash older brother, younger sister relationship with each other. And to an outside party seems like really good. You know, it's like you well, seem to really get along together. You work together well, you, well, seems, you know, resourceful. Yeah, there's, like, like, there, there's also different cultural expectations of a husband, to be fair. Yeah. He's oh, yeah, to... no. And, and well, the thing I like about this is that, like, uh, this scene so, like, cements that relationship, that that sort of, like, familial relationship between the two of them, mo like, like with uh, Aserpa's reaction. <laughs> She's like, ew, they'd be marrying my older brother. Ew. <laughs> She's not even like blushing, like, oh, I couldn't possibly. She's like, ew, no, that's Did not you how really? I see him. Did you really just say that? Yeah. She's embarrassed that her mom is saying, oh, is that your boyfriend? And she's like, yeah. no, mom. Yeah. <laughs> like, not even that. It's just like, ew. I'm not even being coy. Literally, no. <laughs> Literally, no. Plus, if I translated, he'd immediately say no because he's currently trying to bang his dead friend's ex wife. Or, wait, no, huh? <laughs> I don't think a serpent knows that, but I think she does. I think she can read minds. <laughs> I've seen nothing to the contrary. This very entertaining cultural exchange is happening. Meanwhile, back at the plot, <laughs> one of my favorite scenes, which is uh, Samurai Man uh, showing up at a whorehouse at one of the tattooed prisoners banging a lady. Uh, yes, I love this scene. You, you, your voracious sexual appetite will be your downfall, Ushiyama the Undefeated. Hichikata, you're breaking in while I'm banging this broad? Well, lady, you sold me out. I'm now using you as a throwing weapon. <laughs> like, there was just so much going on in the scene that we literally were like, what are we reading right now? I, 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 our, our Discord was multiple people getting brain trusted in on this to confirm, <laughs> yes, this man used the naked prostitute he was having sex with as a projectile weapon. <laughs> <laughs> which Hichikata dodged and drew his sword. I don't know how you dodged that because he was in a doorway and this woman was at least five feet tall thrown horizontally. Just, <laughs> he he ducked don't. really quick. <laughs> just don't think about it. But yes. Oh, it's so insane. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> um, but uh, when uh, we get the uh, bit of the uh, blade uh, getting uh, close enough to lightly tap uh, the other prisoner's uh, head, the shot reverses to show he's uh, uh, pulled a revolver by that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, these, these two are warriors of equal skill. Hey, I, look, I know you're like a samurai, you're part of the Shinsengumi and all that, but why are you still using a sword in this day and age? Well, because no matter how old they get, boys love playing with swords. <laughs> it's true! <laughs> it's all true. Right. Jacob can attest to this. I love this character so much, he's so cool. Jacob owns a cavalry saber, and every time I visit his house, I commandeer it. <laughs> It's objectively true. <laughs> I'm just saying, Sam, we already know you love knives, okay? In case anyone didn't know this, Sam loves knives. They make me feel all warm and tingly. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Now, how about a, uh, how about more bear cub nonsense? Yeah, we get, um, uh, mostly, uh, what we get is, uh, we get some more of, like, the Ainu culture, uh, anthropological bits. Uh, but we also learn a little bit more from the Ainu perspective about what happened when the gold was being stolen. This is something that had been mentioned from the start, but it's it's uh, made explicit here. Like one of the big elements is that the reason why the Ainu were collecting that gold was to uh, uh, sell it in exchange for weapons so that they could fight off the mainland Japanese who were 
taking over their land. <laughs> like this was a this was a fraught situation all the way down. Yeah, um, this is this is being explained by another guy in the tribe, and he seems to be of the opinion that uh, that was not the way to do it. Because as, the thing we've gotten from Aserpa so far is that the Ainu are very big on the fact that taking a human life is super bad. Like, mm -hmm. full stop. It should be avoided at all costs. And mm -hmm. he comes to the conclusion that. Uh, oh. oh yeah, sorry. I, I think the guy explaining this is actually Aserpa's uncle. Yeah, and like. He also uh, comes to the conclusion that because this gold was being, like, gathered to, like, commit homicide, basically, it, depending on if it was justified or not, doesn't seem to matter. Uh, but, like, the other main thing is the process of mining for the gold was, like, scraping Mother Earth and, like, disturbing that. And that, too, is kind of, like, bad in and of itself. And he comes to the conclusion that all those people died for gathering all that gold because like the gold itself was taken for bad means with bad means. So it's cursed. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool because as he's saying that we then cut to a person without skin. <laughs> <laughs> if he's without skin or if it's just like a fire victim. It is a severe fire. Like he has had, he is covered in burn scars. He is missing a nose and ears and he does not appear to have a lower jaw. Yeah, he is messed up. You might say he is a faceless man. Yep. Maybe. <laughs> oh, but anyway, uh, mm -hmm. after they've done gathering uh, food out in the wild, they come back a Serpa's grandma for some food to cook. And she's mm -hmm. cooking. And uh, Sugimoto decides he's going to be a good host. And she's like, hey, grandma, I know we don't speak the language, but I got this delicious stuff that makes soup really good. And oh Serpa's just like, I swear, if you feed my grandma poop soup. <laughs> we're, bringing back, we're bringing back poop soup i am going to bust out the <laughs> the 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 sutu punishment rod it is the rod of discipline Do you live in a cave <laughs> i am gonna put you through a loop if you try and dupe my grandma with your poop soup <laughs> why do you have that weird stick <laughs> why do you carry around the punishment stick doesn't everybody <laughs> I, I like the I like the the side panel of the sutu is used to punish villagers who commit crimes such as theft or homicide. It is not to be used lightly. <laughs> and and Asurpa is just ready to beat the hell out of anyone with it. Well, he's obviously like committed a capital crime. <laughs> he's trying to he's trying to hear grandma poop soup. Or just like grandma likes poop soup. <laughs> Whilst to this adorable scene is going on, uh, we cut to Lieutenant Surumi, uh, who uh, is out in force with the Seventh Division. Uh, he is uh, also known as Forehead Plate Man. Whilst he is out looking for his uh, the the missing soldiers from his patrol, another captain not from the Seventh Division uh, is coming to angrily audit his use of uh, military resources off the books. Uh, Tsurumi responds to this in a uh responds to being uh a finger shoved in his face in a perfectly reasonable and uh, understandable uh way <laughs> finger off <laughs> <laughs> i saw the panel of the captain pointing a finger at forehead plate man oh by the way this is immediately after like while this dressing down is happening something oozes out of the forehead plate over his face and he's like oh excuse me uh, a certain battle in the war uh, some shrapnel from an exploding shell blew off part of the front of my skull so sometimes an odd fluid leaks out yes he is missing normal the things you know, the front of, of his skull plate. So, yes, there is. Uh -huh. He then some... does immediately apologize for biting, saying, sorry, I do have a trouble regulating my temper. It's also just rude to point at people. Other than that, I'm in top condition. A warrior takes pride in his scars. In fact, don't you think it makes me even more handsome? <laughs> you, you're absolutely crazy. Shoot him. Yes, sir. And then the soldier blows the other guy's head off. I, I love the, the way that that's paneled because it's the captain who had his finger bitten off saying, shoot him. One of his uh, own soldiers uh, to which that has been uh, said. And that's the last panel at the bottom corner. I'm like, oh, I know who's getting, <laughs> I know who's getting shot. And then <laughs> yep. turn the page. There it is. 
Tsurumi uh, actually uh, mirrors something that Sugimoto mentioned that for all the um, the pain and brutality that the soldiers went through, they're not living the lives that they were promised uh, when they were sent to the Russo-Japanese War. So uh, our war is not over yet. Because uh, I believe it says they were paid in land in Hokkaido, which uh, upon going there, they found out was basically worthless. <laughs> <laughs> They've gone a little rogue and are now uh fully ready to just um carve out their own little uh slice of paradise so to speak uh meanwhile sugimoto has uh made the classic dumbass decision of i'm too much of a danger for these good people i'm going to leave without any explanation so that the darkness chasing me can't uh, blight their lives. At which point, Asirpa wakes up, looks at his empty cot, realizes what he did, grabs the punishment rod, and heads after him, just muttering under her breath, "That stupid idiot! I swear to God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat him so hard with this stick." He he makes this decision uh, after hearing about uh, Ratar's backstory and therefore, you know, learning something relatively important about Asirpa, about how uh, she lost her parents. Like Ratar will you know, find her and help her uh, regularly, but he is he is a wild wolf. He is not a pet. He'll just wander off to go be with the other wolves sometimes. And uh, she is very sad whenever this happens. I'm pretty sure he's the last of the Enzo wolves, unfortunately. But yeah, he'll he'll wander off into the forest and uh, it makes poor Serpa feel as though uh, uh, she's been abandoned. She lost her parents and she treated... Um, uh, Ratar like a brother, and uh, you know he left too. Such a good scene when uh, Sugimoto chooses to leave. Aserpa's grandmother says something to him, and I knew. Like obviously, he can't speak the language, but he says, "I understand. I know you love her very much. Uh, you and everyone in the village." And that is what causes Sugimoto to choose to leave. And this is, you know, something that I mentioned that, like. You know, from Sugimoto's perspective, he's doing this because he cares about her, and this is coming from a, a, a genuine place of wanting to do right by a Serpa because he doesn't want her to be hurt. But also, he's kind of missing the important part that she has some abandonment issues, Sugimoto. That was yeah. maybe not a good choice. The fact I'm just reflecting on the fact that he's pulled this move before, and it did not pan out necessarily how he would have idealized her. Another person coming into her life just to abandon her is probably not the best thing right now. Yeah, does uh, it yeah. actually, is it, is it actually as helpful as he, he thinks actually, it is? It's actually an incredible selfish decision. <laughs> There's actually a, a pretty good series of panels that reflects why Sugimoto is basically learning the wrong lesson here. Because uh, the panel just before he leaves, or the series of panels, is him going to pet the sleeping bear cub before pulling his hand back and saying, take care of yourself. A Serpa told him not to get attached to the bear cub. Essentially, the act of you raising it will result in its death. And he obviously has grown attached to a Serpa, thinking of her as a uh, sort of a surrogate daughter figure. And so, hmm, thing I am a thing I am emotionally attached to will die by virtue of me raising it. I understand. And he leaves. It's like, no, you idiot. <laughs> That's sort of the thing. It is like what he's doing. He's trying to do right by a Serpa. And it it's so easy to understand why he makes the choice. But like it, you know, it's also easy from our audience perspective to see that that's very much the wrong choice. That's not mm -hmm. what you should be doing. And that that will not only not help her, it'll make her situation worse. You know, it, wow. it shows that Sugimoto for as good a care, like a good a person as he is, he still has a lot of place to go character development wise. Also, speaks a lot to Aserpa's uh, character that her reaction to him leaving is not to wallow in self-pity. It's getting out the punishment rod to tell him, no, this was dumb. You learned the wrong lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Again, she's the most mature character in this story, despite am, being 12. <laughs> I am going to go find my wolf friend and have him hunt you down with your scent. Because you yeah. left a sock behind, dumbass. <laughs> Did he? Well, well, we'll get to that plot twist later. <laughs> I love that plot twist. Also to hammer home how uh, Sugimoto learned the wrong lesson, uh, as soon as he is alone and continuing his mission, he is immediately captured. Yeah, my boy does not make it far. <laughs> he is not the escape king. He is the immortal. Yeah. 
It's he, different. He, he has a bit of a trauma flashback of remembering uh, what happened when he uh, returned home from war to Ume and uh, he brought uh, back uh, her husband's finger bones because that's all he could retrieve. And unfortunately, despite her vision going, um, she still has a, a strong sense of smell, but couldn't recognize Sugimoto's scent. Uh, he reeks of blood. It's drama when he's in town looking for um, the uh, tattooed people that immediately summons the seventh division. Sugimoto might be immortal, but he's not invincible. And uh, there's like five of them all armed. Mm -hmm. I love the twins. I do love the twins. <laughs> <laughs> he does a pretty good job of fighting the twins for a hot minute. He's mostly pissed off he can't tell the difference between the two. <laughs> yeah, he's like, identify yourselves. You guys look like the same, like, ugh. I don't know which I, one to, like, be mad at. I, I, I want to know which one of you is the one who hit me in the face so I can beat you in particular harder. You need to, yeah. be, you need to look more different. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, he, he gets this attention because what he does is he goes to town and immediately starts asking around for uh, tattooed people. And uh, since the seventh division is there in full force, he is caught immediately, uh, mm -hmm. at which point um, he is interrupted from being beaten to death by uh, aforementioned twins by uh, the lieutenant, uh, Captain Four Head Plate. <laughs> who's uh, not what I was about to say. I was worried for a second. What? <laughs> Continue. Okay, but uh, yeah, he he stops them from beating him to death. They're like, no, I need him alive. We're going to interrogate him. You are the immortal, but I am your Shinigami. I can blow out the candle of your life at any time. By the way, uh, do you like Dongo? I love how unhinged this torture. This uh, it's an interrogation is how it's set up, and like mm -hmm. Sugimoto is going into this, going like, if I just deny enough, he won't have a solid case for anything, and I might be able to wiggle out of here at some point. Except this guy is insane. <laughs> Once we find out more about his background, I actually find it kind of funny because they're both, you know, trauma bound in a way from this Russo Japanese war to the fact that they obviously have oh. had to adapt in different ways. Oh yeah, no, he is absolutely a dark reflection of Sugimoto, a hundred percent. Sugimoto is actually coming at this from a pretty clever perspective. You know, he he might have a lot more uh, to do character growth wise, but he also shows that he's quite intelligent because he's he's smart enough to deny being Sugimoto. He's smart enough to deny knowing anything about the gold. Makes up stories to justify why he was looking for people with tattoos. I love it's it. Just he he's doing all like the like cocky smarmy like ah but you can't prove it that you expect in like a good like interrogation scene like ah you might just get be able to talk your way out of this except the lieutenant's insane and after mm. like he eats his dongo just stabs him through the mouth with the skewer going like no i already know you're guilty i don't even really care if i have proof like mm -hmm. doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> you didn't because you didn't even blink when I stabbed you. You're one hell of a man. Exactly what I'd expect from immortal Sugimoto. Because his teeth are clacking together because he's he's loopy. It's like yeah. when you extinguish a candle, I will bite down on the nib. What? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Don't think about what? it. <laughs> I will bite and chew the candle of your life down to a nub if I have to. <laughs> if the flame cannot be extinguished, the candle will just have to run out. It's not how candles work. <laughs> <laughs> because as established, this is a perfectly healthy and rational individual. <laughs> mm -hmm. Stop That's trying when... to rationalize someone who's a madman. Yep. And then on the chapter break is when we get the scene of um, a Serpa has come with uh, Ritar to the edge of the city with uh, Sugimoto's sock going like, well, we're going to have to track him down and find him. And you're like, oh, is she going to break in before he kills him in the interrogation? No, but... <laughs> <laughs> have the chapter of uh the snuffle and about uh ratar manages to find the owner of the sock uh asirpa breaks in and start and while uh owner of sock is distracted by uh wolf asirpa starts bopping him with the punishment rod but it's actually the escape gang it's Shiraishi! <laughs> <laughs> i i love also like this whole like for the whole rest of this 
I mean, he's the escape king. He keeps trying to escape. The way that uh, Ritara uh, keeps uh, catching him is uh, he'll, like, nibble on the guy's skull. <laughs> it's just this terrifying, imposing wolf who's just like, nah. I love that. Uh... <laughs> when we get the backstory for why Sugimoto had um, the Escape King socks, it's because they accidentally swapped them when they had dried out the clothes. Uh, and Serpa's <laughs> face is. is so disgusted that they would wear each other's socks is just... <laughs> <laughs> that's disgusting. Oh, so that's why one of my socks look new. Anyway, <laughs> tough, tough luck about losing you, Sugimoto, kid. Anyway, I'm going to be on with my day now. You're going to tell me where he is or I will shoot you with this poisoned arrow. Okay. <laughs> let, let me just go uh, uh, grab my shoes. <laughs> uh, let me just go wash my face. And he starts running, gets caught by a dog. Yep. And then we cut back to uh, Sugimoto. He pops out of the snow into Doggo's mouth. I love it. <laughs> then we cut back to Sugimoto. He is in the back room of some place tied to a chair. And the twins come in going like, ha ha, we're going to take out our knives and we're going to kill him and say he tried to fight back. And then Sugimoto's like, I'm not going to have any of this. And my man flips the chair he's sitting in <laughs> to headbutt one of them in the face. In the process, shattering the chair to free himself. Oh, by the way, he's now got two Dongo skewers punched through his cheek. Yeah, his also, cheeks, both of them. Also, he makes a point of, of uh, headbutting one of them hard enough to knock out a tooth so he can tell them apart. <laughs> there we go. Now I can tell you I saw us apart. Because he, he can't bring his teeth together because of the skewers. Oh, there's also a neat bit at the end of this chapter where... Um, uh, we get the uh, translation for what Aserpa's grand, uh, grandma had said to Sugimoto that like, boy, as Sugimoto uh, is uh, at, uh, during this scuffle being stabbed, we uh, hear in the heart. Yeah, we hear we hear her saying, uh, please always be there for her, which is all the m even more painful because again sugimoto thinks by leaving her he is being there for her which uh, is wrong <laughs> another another case of lost in translation mm -hmm. the dramatic irony he thinks he's being there for her by leaving he's just wrong about that fact so it's so like uh like you know the main well you know it's one of those ones where it's like you know the main character is not going to die in, in before chapter 20 you would think but like mm -hmm. also it like it so engrosses you it's like you you need him to be okay <laughs> because yeah. he, can't, he has to he has to be there for a surf of the right way <laughs> yeah I read it's more like situational irony of the fact that you know usually there's a tense moment in a lot of dramas whether they be you know manga anime whatever where it's just like you don't speak the same language but you're still able to pick up on like the intent yeah or the emotion behind it and it's usually pretty accurate this was just like such a ironic miss that, that that's kind of like how almost, i took it which was kind of comical to me and i'm just like oh well i mean that's sort of that's sort of the thing that um, th the way it worked for me was that he uh, he did understand the sentiment that it was like he like um a serpa's grandpa or grandma wanted him to do right by a serpa it's just he you know he's not he didn't understand what a serpa needs uh she and escape king are hunting down the seventh division uh mostly with retar retar is real helpful he is and now it's time such a pupper. i love him it Indeed. And now it's time to hit the uh, the life will change music because we have to pull a heist in order to get Sugimoto out of there. I love how they look through the window to see where he's being captured. And he's currently getting beaten up by every other member of the 7th Division. And the he's alive. Sort of, he's alive. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> so uh, their plan is actually a pretty good one. Uh, the bars on that window are weak enough that a wild running horse could uh, bend them up a bit so that uh, contortionist escape king can get in there. Uh, well, they're they're rusty enough that uh, he can mm. bend the bars enough to uh, contort himself inside. But then how would Sugimoto get out? With some bear grease. 
Uh-huh. Um, but then how would Sugimoto get out? And that's when he he'll tie a rope to the bars so that a horse can pull the bar the bars entirely out of the window so Sugimoto can also get out. And that's where we, mm-hmm. we get the panel of naked escape king has greased himself up to slip <laughs> shimmy through the bars. I <laughs> love imagine waking up to that. He flops, it, he flops it and goes, Good evening. Oh God. <laughs> Excuse me, Schwab. <laughs> <laughs> are you a ghost i'm the escape king shiraishi oh yeah why are you here why are you here because the crazy i know girl threatened to shoot me if i didn't help you oh oh, tracks. oh i learned the wrong lesson <laughs> i love the look on Sukimoto's face <laughs> that is that is very like i don't I, I don't know how uh, whether or not he'd uh, like like he's character developed enough to not make that sort of mistake again. But he he does recognize that. Oh, I learned the wrong lesson. Unfortunately, the horses have uh, twigged to the presence of the giant wolf and so are freaking out prematurely. Uh, the twins go in to finish their murder. Uh, Sugimoto is now free and has a knife. So <laughs> we are uh, treated to a uh, very scary tableau of one of the twins dead, neck twisted all the way around, and Sugimoto slumped against the wall with entrails pouring out of his shirt. I loved this bit because, mm-hmm. like, it, it's one of those ones where it's like, I think I know where this is going, but I hope I don't think that just because it's what I really hope is where this is going. <laughs> Again, it's that it's that tension of, uh, you know, like, from... You know, from a pure, like, narrative perspective, it wouldn't make sense to kill the main character in this way. But also, I'm so invested that the two of them reunite. <laughs> well, it's also the fact, as it's re- re- realized later on, is the fact that our unhinged, you know, general does, he's unhinged, but he does see, like, the investment in keeping, um... Take him to the best. Take him, yeah. Take him to the best surgeon, and then he whispers to one of his people, uh, "Keep him alive long enough for him to spill the details, and then just dump him somewhere in the woods." Let's, because what I really like is that end panel when he's asking with the entrails held out. It's a very cool, like the page is split between three shots of him looking like he's dying on the ground. The lieutenant looking into the room on this, just like, oh, because he's yeah, given up. It's a, it's a weird, weird facial and expression th- where it's like he's slowly into this. And yes. Then, Excellent. And then a Serpa looking distraught because she's outside wondering where everyone is. And like it sets it up like, oh, shit, is he dying? And it's just so cool because he's just like, look, I don't care about live. I do not care about the gold anymore. Take me to a hospital. <laughs> like, I just need to live. He cares mm. about his reputation. He is the immortal. He can't and I'm die. literally the immortal guy. I cannot die. It's, it's part of my brand, everyone. It's part All of right. it. oh. oh, well, if it's your brand, then I get it. <laughs> All right. That's how he survived the war. He's just like, guys, 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 come on. I've got perfect attendance. I can't be sick today. <laughs> Is that how it works? All right, take him to the hospital. I don't care who you have to shoot. All right, so let's examine this crime scene. A deep wound on the right hand. It's a defensive wound, and uh, his left hand is fine. Uh, Did you wound him with that wounded hand, Sugimoto? And hey, by the way, why are there three fingerprints? Yeah, he realizes that the slashed hand with the defensive wound was the hand that the the dead guy had the knife in, which is weird. More importantly, he notices that guy is missing his guts. Uh Uh-huh. Why are there bloody fingerprints on the underside of his belt? Why would you redo his belt? As they cut to Sugimoto standing up, holding the intestines, looming like the the devil himself. (laughs) As forehead plate man says, you stole his intestines. (laughs) And he- Hey, it wasn't wishful thinking. (laughs) Sugimoto, cool guys don't look at explosions, throws the guts over his shoulder and attacks the driver of the sled. We have a chase where the lieutenant is holding a revolver on. It's a pistol, actually. It's not a revolver. Yeah. But um, as he is riding a horse after this sled speeding away with uh, a serpa with a bow in hand, like arrow notched, like huh. riding on Ratar. Oh, so, is this a Western or? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, this is super Western because what happens is she hits the horse. 
kills the horse and the lieutenant jumps off the horse and starts running from <laughs> jumping off the horse. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most menacing panel. <laughs> He's just booking it after Sugimoto raises the gun. Up. He lines up the shot too, and then at the last second goes, nah, that's enough for today. <laughs> Turns around. <laughs> but how did the horse die? I didn't hear a gunshot. Hmm, a bit of meat cut away from the thigh. No, Ratar, you can't eat this. It's got poison in it. <laughs> and you want doggo. It. The doggo is sad because the doggo wants it. <laughs> He's hungry. Yeah. Hey, I hey, want... hey, boss. Uh, the base is on fire. Should we go in for the? Should we go in for the tattooed skin? <laughs> no, no. It is safe with me. <laughs> Undoes his coat, reveals he's wearing several people's flayed skin as a jacket. Yeah, um... I'm sweating thanks to this. It is quite hot. <laughs> and yeah, then one um... of the guys is like, so that's why I couldn't find it. Creepy bastard. Yeah, that's a fair assessment. <laughs> I mean, is he unhinged or is he unhinged? Okay, no los dos. I don't think there's a word to describe this guy, and I love it. <laughs> so and, we have uh, our reunion which includes getting bonked with the punishment stick mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty great at this point the uh the big narrative motions of our reading section are uh concluded we mostly get the escape king uh tentatively uh decides to join the group my second favorite cooking segment where uh because the escape king's there the mainland japanese have a uh, recipe preference and because they've got all this horse meat, they try to decide to make some horse meat sukiyaki. Yes, yeah, so, so there is a weird meat fight that happens as <laughs> they're butchering this this horse. Look, 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 Jay, sometimes you just get two army guys together and they start slapping each other with their meat. <laughs> what are you going to do? God damn it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a very yeah. accurate description. Have you seen and Top Gun? It's basically a documentary about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just going to highlight that Ritar is also like very torn. He's like... I want it. I want some. <laughs> and Ritar does get some. He's very happy. But uh, very the happy. main the main crux of this is they uh, dip the meat, the horse meat and eggs, cook it, eat it. And uh, it goes really good with miso soup. Oh, and I they finally convince a Serpa to try the poop soup. <laughs> There's this really uh, adorable moment of uh, a Serpa is finally like forcing herself to try something that uh, she finds gross. And uh, uh, Sugimoto realizes, oh, I've been doing this to her the entire time. Not really, because he's tried it. It's taken him how many times to convince her to eat it? Yeah, but it, it, it's it's a cute <laughs> moment of him recognizing, you know... <laughs> this Osama is delicious. It's not poop. <laughs> I guess that it's not poop as he's wiping tears from his eyes. It, it, his his daughter who has finally tried the miso. Anyway, yep. We uh, we th anyway we then cut to uh, Hijikata who is buying guns from an arms dealer. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. he's he's finally getting with the times. He's upgrading. We uh, conclude with uh, Hijikata being unbelievably badass for basically an entire chapter. I love this uh, chapter so much. Man has a Winchester in one hand and a katana in the other. Neither of those are one-handed weapons. <laughs> he does the badass one-handed Winchester lever action rifle gun twirl <laughs> like several what, times. What? But he does it while drawing his katana. <laughs> It's so cool! Kill them all! No one gets out of here alive! <laughs> the man's a stanced up! He is the perfect blend of cowboy and samurai! He is Ishin, the sword saint! <laughs> I love this guy so much! He's well, it's also so the fact cool. that he's just purchased and picked up this weapon and is somehow a master. Uh-huh. <laughs> he wants to try out his new toy. Like, boys, no matter how old they get, love playing with swords. Also guns. <laughs> and also guns. But uh, more importantly, what we do get from this is uh, after he kills this group of people, the uh, person he was teaming up with momentarily says, I was just in it for the gold. Who could ever take your dream of taking over Hokkaido seriously? And he's just like, hey, there are tons of people that want to liberate this land. Oh, where would they be? 
They've been living here for a long, long time. And then we cut to the prison, and we see the faceless man. He recognizes. And, sa- and he says a serpa. Wait, mm. he doesn't see her. He's just, like, thinking of her. No, yeah, but he uh-huh. says her name. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he does not have fourth wall powers to see that her panel is... I so don't know. Person. I'm just saying, of all the unhinged people in this manga so far, I would not be surprised. You see, Jay, sometimes <laughs> panels are side by side. That doesn't mean they're spatially next to each other. They're thematically <laughs> next to each other. <laughs> He's being wistful. So yeah, that's totally her dad, right? I, that's what I'm guessing. That, that was, yeah, I was just like, totally. Very interesting. We totally know that her dad, you know, was a confirmed death right well that's what that's what we had been told up to this point Mm -hmm. frankly in a mainland japanese prison cell and killed are effectively the same thing to the ainu villagers like yeah yep but we also don't know if perhaps they might have been lied to for reasons well here's the other thing the rest of the ainu with her dad did die and the person currently blamed for it is is the faceless man. Yeah, I mean... So, so maybe uh, yeah. her dad didn't do some good things. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe he was blacklisted because, you know, he killed people, and that makes you a bad person. Indeed, an evil god, a faceless man. Metaphors. Anyway, uh, Metaphors. The, two, the two main characters get a weird one-page thing of apparently when um, maple trees freeze icicles. Uh, the sap leaks out, and they create very tasty uh, little Treats. freezer pops. Yeah, um, makes we sense. Cut, uh, we cut on one little food sting, and then that's the end of our reading. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, that is the end of our reading. And so, um, classic shonen questions for the discussion, everybody. Favorite character and favorite fight. Uh, look, I know I said Ratar is my favorite, but also Escape King, but also Sirpa, but also Sugimoto. There's a lot of really good characters in this manga. Oh, the characters, absolutely. Not to say that any other part of the story is lacking, but the characters absolutely carry the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I would say Escape King overall is my favorite. He uh, has very uh, few appearances in the reading we've done so far, but I knew from his first show up that he had the aura of recurring character and I liked his gimmick a lot. So I'm happy to see that he showed up some more and was crucial to the plot and now seems to be a third member of the team. Uh, as for favorite fight, I, I <laughs> the escape from the seventh division, the, the heist against the twins and the stolen intestines and the chase on the horses. And it, it's got everything. <laughs> it, it is a perfect action scene as far as I'm concerned. It's got deception. It's got amazing stunts. It's got a fire. It's great. Uh, let's see. Jacob, how about you? Obviously, favorite character is so hard. Aserpa is such an incredibly interesting character, and she is adorable, and I want to give her all the head pats, and um, just what a great character. And Sugimoto... Like, I I love the fact that he recognized I have to do right by a Serpa. That's what her grandmother is telling me. And he earnestly tries to do right by her in the worst possible way. Like, it's such a great place for a character to grow from, you know. And what they do to never let you forget that he has so much blood on his hands. And he is not a squeaky clean person, but at the very core of him, he is a good man regardless of what else comes his way. You know, he's a survivor, but a good person. Makes him an absolutely amazing character. Captain Forehead Plate is one of the wackiest, craziest, coolest, unhinged villains I've seen in a long time. (laughs) That too. And then, (laughs) yay, Doggo! I love uh, Ratar because not only is he an adorable dog, what acts like a dog, which makes him even cuter, but he has also got a lot of personality to him too. But man, Hajikata is just the coolest character I have seen in such a long time. (laughs) Why is he so cool? He is like... He's a samurai cowboy, Jacob. I have so many number one favorite characters, but if you twisted my arm and forced me to pick someone, Hajikata... (laughs) I was about to say, Jacob, you were two people away from naming the entire cast. Yeah, no, absolutely. And 
I did that on purpose because it's true. <laughs> like so many great characters, so much of the cast overall, like even Escape King, like so many of these characters would be the best character in any other series, like just individually on their own. So many of these people could carry a manga or a TV show or anything you want solo. It's just, So it's like you have to pick from among so many number ones. But my God, that last chapter with Hajikata just being unbelievably bad. <laughs> and so I, I guess that's your favorite fight. Then. That's my favorite fight, too. Like, honestly, Sam's pick is probably better because it is a more dynamic thing. But man, it's so cool. <laughs> Jay, favorite character, favorite fight. So favorite character would definitely would have to say a Serpa. She was by a, by a long stretch. I want to say the adult in this situation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what was not previously mentioned is I loved panel to panel to panel. Her facial expressions, <laughs> reactions were like on point. I, I had to rate like one of the most expressive characters in this entire manga. It was a Serpa. Um, I particularly enjoyed not only the cultural exchanges, but just her reaction to, you know, different types of, I guess, mainland Japanese customs, just her facial expressions of disgust <laughs> or just like abhor shock sold it for me. Um, favorite fight for me would definitely have to be the bear fight when they are running specifically from the seventh division, just because a lot of the you know, wisdom about how to s avoid a, a bear attack was um, partially implemented. And also we have to see the ramifications for those who blatantly ignore that, but also just <laughs> not very often that we get to see people, well, maimed by huge brown bears. <laughs> I mean... In, in graphic detail. <laughs> in graphic detail. And then be able to see somebody who has essentially had their, well, has had their face removed still i guess moving around and and you know landing that killing blow to mm -hmm. bear so yeah that would be that would be my favorite fight man against nature <laughs> and matt uh well her favorite character unfortunately jacob took mine uh <laughs> No, um, uh, Lieutenant Surumi. I, I love him. He is, he is an amazing antagonist. Uh, he points out flaws in Sugimoto. Um, he, he makes Sugimoto a better character with his reactions. Mm -hmm. The fact that he could have shot Sugimoto in the head and just seemingly decided not to on a whim. <laughs> great. I, I love it. That's um, more interesting this way. Yeah. Like the fights. Golden Cameo, I'm going to just say, has some of the best fights in, like, anything we've read. So mm -hmm. all of them are, like, amazing. I can't think of a bad fight. I can't think of one that I would consider, like, not top-tier fights of everything we've read. Like, uh, if I had to narrow it down, uh, Escape from the 7th Division is just, like, the culmination of so many cool things. Mm -hmm. uh, with, um, just, like, from... My Sugimoto flips the chair he's tied to, like... <laughs> <sighs> Just in a, f a full front flip from a sitting position. Yeah, and then uh, close second is Hajikata just cowboying his way through a uh, <laughs> gangster meeting. Oh, man, I, I, I love that we all had different favorite characters because... It shows the strength of a cast, yeah. Part of this was a bit of an uh, anthropological adventure. I remember reading in uh, some of the volume ends that there was uh, several uh, I knew people who served as consultants on the uh, cultural representation of this, which is very cool. So uh, there's a lot of genuine stuff to learn about a new culture here. What was some of the I knew customs? Uh, or your favorite I knew custom you uh, enjoyed learning about. Uh, I already said that mine was the the habit of naming kids after disgusting things so that uh, <laughs> uh, illness spirits will avoid them. That is hilarious. And also it like um, clicks in my brain in a sort of pseudo logic way. And I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it also in introduced uh, a very fun character who just walks around screaming his name, which means poop. <laughs> 
Uh, reverse order. Matt, how about you? So uh, my favorite was actually uh, it got brought up when they went to uh, a Serpa's village. Her grandma, um, when they were eating, would occasionally take a bit of the food and offer it over her shoulder because they say that is where their guardian spirit sleeps and like keeps an eye over them. Um, mm -hmm. And she says, like, it watches out for you and protects you in times of danger. And Sugimoto is just like, wow, mine is pulling overdrive then. Like, I owe him a lot and is constantly, <laughs> like, doing it with his food. And the fact that a Serpa just looks at him like he is behaving like a child, going like, wait, why aren't you doing it? It's like, that's not really a thing we do. That's something the old people do. <laughs> and then the grandma's just like, young whippersnapper doesn't respect the old ways. <laughs> <laughs> Which also is not helping the like, you should marry him. He respects our customs. <laughs> uh, Jay, how about you? I was saying that I really enjoyed um, the field dressing aspects of it. I was really um, appreciated some of the field recipes that they um, explored. Um, Sitatap specifically, because it just reminded me in my mind of like steak tartare. Steak tartare. Mm -hmm. um, but... Yeah, um, I also enjoyed um, learning about, you know, how they prepared um, rabbit and how they prepared, you know, like the bear meat and everything like that and made it into, you know, a palpable field stew. Mm -hmm. And Jacob. Uh, here's another one where we all have a, a, a different favorite thing. Um, I really liked the depth that they went into with how, like, the little animal traps worked. They would show, like, a little diagram of how, like, the, the, the squirrel snare trap would work or that um, you'd have the, like, um, stakes placed into uh, an animal trail to funnel them into a specific spot where, you know, like, the snare would be uh, for the rabbits. Just because, you know, I've, I've sort of, um, for most of my life, had sort of a, uh, I, I wouldn't call myself an outdoorsman, but I've had like a foot in the wild, I suppose. Um, and uh, I, I find that so sort of stuff interesting. You know, it's like a, normally a series wouldn't go into detail about how the, the you know, how the squirrel or rabbit snares actually worked, but they, they show you the, the mechanical aspects of it that I thought were neat. Indeed, indeed. All right. And uh, would you continue reading? Uh, resounding yes from me. And I get the feeling <laughs> the rest of the cast as well. I, I, I feel it kind of goes without saying how much I love this. Yeah, uh, I we hit, still haven't hit the part I got to in the anime, but uh, I remembered how much I loved this series rereading it. So, yeah, I would continue reading in a heartbeat. Yeah, absolutely here. Um, like I said, the manga was top tier as far as just entertainment value. Having originally seen the anime, the manga is ramps that comedic factor up, but also the action like by like easily 10. So yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you everyone once again for listening to the Over Manga Cast. Make sure to follow us on all of your social medias where we are at Over Manga Cast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are, we've got uh, memes aplenty. And uh, boy, there's uh, fertile ground with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with this, this series. <laughs> <laughs> you can also like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube, where our episodes go up uh, two weeks after uh, they're up everywhere else on there. Uh, it's a good place to... Uh, I phrase that uh, very cleanly, as you can tell. But uh, that is a good place to uh, leave comments on individual episodes. Uh, give us that good, good engagement. Oh, and if you... Uh, have any suggestions for us uh shoot us a dm at overmangacast or uh overmangacast at gmail.com send us an email or if you just go to overmangacast.com uh there's a little uh, message thing at the bottom of every page in fact Indeed. if you're listening to there right now scroll down stop being lazy do it <laughs> You can do it. We believe in you. And uh, of course, we also appreciate any reviews on your podcatcher of choice. And tune in next week where uh, we are getting in some monsters. It's Kaiju number eight, where we will have a special guest. Matt, who is our special guest? Uh, we are being joined by letterer of Kaiju number eight, Brandon Bovia. Yes, so if you want to keep up with the show, read chapters 1 through 23, and we will see you all next Thursday. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs>